Stand by. Coming to you from the HagmanReport.com studio, located in the Keystone State, birthplace of a mighty nation, it's your host, Doug Hagman. Welcome to Hagman. This is the Hagman Report, where truth can't be silenced. HagmanReport.com. That's HagmanReport.com. That's where you need to go for all of the shows. That's the uh, centerpiece of, uh, well, from for print content to uh, shows to uh, audio, video, whatever you need, it's at HagmanReport.com. Remember, two ends on Hagman. And again, where truth can't be silenced. Also, uh, for uh, my book, HagmanStore.com, or on Amazon. And I appreciate uh, people... Uh, um, it's actually eight countries, uh, big in the UK and uh, uh, big in, uh, oh, well, eight countries right now. So it's, or nine countries, I'm sorry, nine countries. So it's, it's really doing well. Thank you so much for that. Um, very special program. I don't want to waste any time with, with me. Um, and actually, the individual who's going to really kind of take charge of this show today is my good friend. And I mean my good friend, Russ Dizdar. Um, and also we have a very, very special guest. Remember, I kind of teased this. I really didn't, I didn't want to, uh, give away the, um, who this guest was only because of the interference that could be messed with or, you know, how we could be messed with. And that's a gentleman by the name of John Ledger. And you're going to be hearing, uh, Russ talk to John or I'm, of course I'll be talking to John and, uh, now he's in the United Kingdom. He's in London, the UK right now. Um, he's been so generous with his time to, uh, to come on with Russ and I. And I just, just to lay this out a little bit, I want to tell everyone this. You know, um, Russ Dizdar, Craig Sawyer, those, um, Russ and his team, uh, I have so much respect for. I've been, do- I've been doing investigative work for 35 years. And I have worked with everyone from uh, FBI agents, Department of Justice officials, uh, ATF, DEA, uh, DHS, uh, give me an initial or give me a set of initials. I've worked with those agents. I have never seen the level of professionalism, the level of, uh, of, uh, um, expertise in the combination of Russ and this team. And he does, they do so, um, with the spirit of God behind them. And, you know, that's what's missing a lot of times in investigations. But these, especially in this kind of work, uh, so I've got immense, immense respect for and immense love for uh, Russ Dizdar and his team, every every team member. Um, incredible and just incredible. And what I've seen, and, and he allowed me to uh, be part of uh, his work recently, folks, you know, because... I, I took some time, and uh, just from what I've seen, it, it, the 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 effectiveness of Rust Isdar, I would match up against any law enforcement official, any pastor. Um, I mean, it's just it, 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 because there, there's an interfacing there, interface there. So with that, um, by the way, Rust Rust Isdar, uh, ShatterTheDarkness.net. Make sure you fill yourself with all, with just all sorts of assets from there, from, uh, from the videos to the material. I mean, just go to ShatterTheDarkness.net. Uh, of course, Ragged Edge Radio. There is so much information there. It'll keep you busy for days. But understand what uh, Russ does and his team does. And, of course, his, um, John Ledger from the, from the U.K., some very important information. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Russ, not because I want a day off or a show off, but uh, I, I just I, – I, Russ will set this up and Russ will um, take this through uh, what we need to talk about today. And uh, so I'm going to just stop right there. Russ, thank you so very much for joining me. Sure. Doug, good to be here again today and good to be with everybody. Uh, glad to uh, – uh, to bring some updates, I know if you've been listening to the Ragged Edge Radio lately, I've just done, I've never done this before, I've just done 30, I think 39 hours, separate days, one hour broadcast, updating satanic ritual abuse because 
uh, not only is uh, the reality of it, but it's um, it's not going away. It's increasing. So I wanted to bring updates, even since I, the book I wrote about 12 years ago and all the things we do and what you know about us. Uh, the case that Doug's talking about is a huge case. I would say on the level, I'm being very frank about this, on the level of, a, of an Epstein issue. Um, so we are involved in a number of cases all over, but this case here and in, in where Doug came in, and Doug, Doug has mentioned <laughs> professionalism and things. We also have a lot of fun, um, and, and the centrality of all of this is just reaching victims for Jesus, bringing healing and help and everything else. But we realized along the years, uh, Doug, that – uh, you have to deal with the with the perpetrators because in, in 40 years of doing this, I've never, never, never met a perpetrator that wanted to repent or or stop or, or, or do anything. They, they, you know, hardcore, satanically oriented, we're talking eyes wide shut kind of people that, um, that have the network, the rings, the physical secrecy, the supernatural secrecy, have all the backing intertwined and all, you know, all the stuff we can talk about government and, and um, so... As we're saying this, this is today, I have had um, just a day ago, just one day ago, the FBI showed up here at my house, the uh, federal officers came to my home, and uh, they wanted an interview about some of the things we're saying, some of the things we're doing, and it was all, actually, it was all good, it was fine, but uh, this is part of the overall picture when we talk satanic ritual abuse, I'm telling stats like 150 million worldwide. I'm I'm telling you that after 40 years of you know we've been to Germany and France and Poland and 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 Geneva, Switzerland and in in Scotland. So out of all of this and dealing with all the victims and dealing with the perpetrators, we need to go after them. Two things: we need to we need to make sure that we can go after them, but we need to pray and 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 seek the greatest exposure of the perpetrators than ever before because again they don't stop and they've increased um we could talk about the abortion issues which i hate we could talk about the drug scourge here killing eighty thousand americans a year and i hate that we could talk about human trafficking all over the place and we'll talk about that with john wedger today also because uh scotland i just got a new notice uh, from scotland about 23 kids per day were going missing during the covid crisis uh, between the ages of 1 and 18. So you have 23 kids going. Now, when we were in Scotland at Dundee, we went to a ritual abuse conference. That's where we met Wilfred Wong. This He's one of the experts also, and John Wedger knows him. And, and John Wedger is probably uh, the uh, premier um, expert on the satanic ritual abuse side, the um, South African, the, the, voodoo, the voodoo side of this coming into human trafficking. Uh, and so we're going to get into uh, hearing from him in a few moments. And and so this is um, because of the secrecy of this. It's hard enough to tell people about human trafficking and all that's going on. Our, our little slogan we have written on T-shirts, one, one kid is too many. One kid, if you understand the abuse, and I know that people are going to be watching that have been abused and have, been, have gone through all that abuse, you know, it keeps me up at nights at times. Last night, I received a phone call from somebody we, we worked with 20 years ago. In some of the most severe abuse, the most sophisticated side of satanic ritual abuse, MK Ultra, Monarch, all of that stuff, the real stuff. Not fa- See, there is fabrication. There is disinformation. There's a lot of people running around, but... But Doug, there's, 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 um, when we began to go investigate it in 1980 and go after it to say, is this real? Well, then we ran into it, you know, all the reality of it, the blood and guts of it. So, uh, one victim is just too many, but then you talk about millions, human trafficking worldwide, satanic ritual abuse and the trafficking, uh, those numbers are astounding. And they all have relationship to a real dark side, a real Satan, a real, you know, real demonic stuff. This is why they do what they do. Uh, and, and so kind of leading into all of this, people that know my background, we have been engaging and working and doing this and trying to help as many as possible. We are way, way beyond our ability to get everybody because uh, we have way too many requests. Uh, and I know that John would say the same thing in, in England. So 
just to give a little inter, in, you know, inter, you know, introduction to John Wedger, when we went to Scotland, Tom Dunn from Through the Black, myself, we went to we went there to um, Dundee for a, a ritual abuse conference. That's where we met Wilfred Wong. Uh, we recognized 25, 26 years he was doing satanic ritual abuse, uh, helping victims, but also investigating as a barrister and his background and and what he has. We were pretty astounded. But I, I, and this is important for everyone in the UK. I asked, I asked what Mr. Wilfred Wong, uh, you know, you know all about satanic ritual abuse and the multiple personality and the demons and programming. And he said yes. And I said, you've been doing this for over twenty-five years. And he said yes. So I, he didn't know me. I just bluntly asked him, why are they here in the United Kingdom? Because now we've gone all around the world and found the hundreds of thousands in the, in the stats now that are off the charts and his immediate response from England, one of the, you know, one of, one of the experts was they've been, they're here to infiltrate this nation eventually to help collapse this nation and make way for a new world order. Uh, that was pretty astounding information. Uh, it, but it's what we found everywhere. So what we when we talk about satanic ritual abuse, we're talking about the victims that have been behind this, the reality of the demonic and satanic side. We're also talking about an agenda that goes all the way back to the Nazis to this day that has everything to do with the end of days, but it also uh, means you know the use of the dark side of human beings as commodities. Just like human trafficking, it's all about commodities. If there was no money to be made, basically among human traffickers, you know, uh, other than just their perverted, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, indulgences or whatever, uh, there wouldn't be a whole lot. But it's about you know hundreds of millions, billions worldwide when it comes to human trafficking, the ritual abuse things, and we need to have the greatest exposure ever. So that's one of the things I'm going to leave with the audience today. We need to pray that the greatest exposure, explicit exposure, factual exposure, um, than anything that's ever been. See, I know that it's out there. There's videos, there's flash drives, there's information, there's locations. I took Doug to some locations. Uh, we, um, we know that there's broader information that is, that is beyond smoking gun that needs to come out. And it will happen by massive prayer. And uh, many people going after it, and by the hand of God, to uh, just rip open that underground, and that needs to happen uh, for the sake of the victims, for the reality of this whole this whole dark underworld, and 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 then um, we need we need to see tens of thousands of believers become very powerful, and become believers who will go after this and help out and work out with you know work with the victims and so forth. So, having said all that. And having said that, uh, we're engaging more SRAs than ever, and and uh, it's way beyond our ability to reach everybody. So we're going to continue to train and recruit and do what we can in our our, our side of things. But I'm I'm so glad to talk about uh, the United Kingdom, London. Um, uh, we uh, we 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 flew into we flew into uh, Edinburgh. We uh, were driven up to Dundee, and of course we flew out of uh, Heathrow in London, but. We, we found out about John Wedger through um, Wilford Wong, and we began to look at some of the vid videos that, and, and looked at uh, John Wedger Foundation, and, and you you got to look that up. So we now have somebody who's a major law enforcement you know individual out of uh, London and out of England who has uh, massive, massive years as far as background to all this, engaging all this. I'm glad to report that John Wedger is a strong believer, knows about spiritual warfare, knows the reality of all the, the ritual side of this, um, from the, the sheer satanic side, the whole pedophile, you know, um, behind-the-scenes system that's uh, throughout the uh, United Kingdom, the reason why they want to keep it hush-hush over there. So I'm not going to say anything more than that other than to introduce John Wedger from the United Kingdom, a good brother. I, I, I can't wait to come over and fly over to see him. We've been hindered by the COVID issues, but uh, we're hoping to get over there uh, soon and see him and uh, follow with uh, Wilfred Wong. But John Wedger, uh, introduce yourself. And uh, share what you do. And, and if yeah. I can just, uh, I'm sorry, let me just interrupt. I apologize, Mr. Wedger. I, I'm looking at, <laughs> at print. Okay. I'm looking at your name in print. I, I've, I've heard your name a thousand times, and I, I mispronounced your last name, John Wedger. I, so I, I apologize to you, and I apologize to the audience. Go ahead, sir. No problem. Well, firstly, thank you so much for having me on your show. 
I'd like to thank Wilfred for being a conduit and a good friend of mine, James, as well, who um, uh, linked me in uh, to Russ via email. A bit of background about myself. Um, I do apologise for where I am at the moment. It's only because uh, we've had a couple of rough days. Um, been subject to quite a few death threats. Uh, so we've had a very up and down couple of days. I think that's all due to the solstice occurring. But um, earlier on, my car was taken off the road because it was uh, it, it nearly crashed. It was very, very unsafe. So I'm walking back from the scrapyard now. That's why I'm I'm walking and I'm not at home. So uh, it's we, we, this is all about a spiritual warfare, without a doubt. Um, I'm a friend of Jesus Christ. And for me, the only way to combat this is through Jesus. Um, and, and I've seen I've seen testimony to that. M my career, I'm uh, served 25 years uh, with the Metropolitan Police. Um, I was a detective, and I gained prominence on the international sort of media circuit for my role as a whistleblower. Um, now, I specialised in what's called um, child sexual abuse investigations. So it's blown my life. Uh, from very early on in, in my investigations, I was silenced. I've been silenced three, three times, three major times uh, for my efforts to expose cover-ups involving paedophilia. The first time was to do with sex offenders um, escaping uh, capture and escaping what they call registry, because we've got the Sex Offenders Registry Act here, in which sex offenders upon conviction, release um, from prison or a caution for a sexual offence, have to sign on a register. And they have to tell um, the police authority, because UK, our, we, we've just got one police, so we've got, we've got a police service, but it's split up into boroughs, a bit like counties. And um, uh, we've got, I think we've got about 50 within the UK, um, and we all come under common law. Uh, we haven't uh, got a federal police force. We've got a national crime agency, which um, deals with inter inter county sort of um, crime. But on the whole, it's done on a local level. And see what happened is these these um, people went when they were uh, required to sign on this register. Oops, they uh, were was just going missing. No one knew where they went. And it turned out they were living on, on boats. Now, we've got a canal network in the UK. You know, we're an ancient land. And, uh, you know, the communication network here was one of the first in the world. I think it was the first in the world, you know, modern world anyway, without going back to ancient times. And we've got this canal network. And it was, it was for trade. But now it's come for leisure and accommodation. And you can live on these boats. They've been converted into homes. And you can move up and down the UK with impunity without being caught. Now, there is relevance to SRA. I, I will get to it. It's all intertwined. Now, what happened was these sex offenders were going missing. No one knew where they were. And I got information that they were living on these boats. And I was asked if I would go out and track them down. And they said, we know of two within London. Now, London is unique in policing in as much as... The, the other county forces within the UK, they, they cover huge um, square mileage. Sorry, so, sorry about that. Uh, can you hear me okay? It's just some it was an incoming call. I had to cancel it. They cover a huge, huge square mileage, whereas London is broke up into um, 25 different like individual policing districts. But they all come under one jurisdiction, which is like New Scotland Yard, as it were. And these canals and these rivers... They're so old that they form the boundaries between these different London boroughs. But what happens is people can live on a boat um, and within 28 days, they have to go to the policing district where they reside and inform them of their presence. So all they do is they go on the boat and they move in some occasions two, three metres to the other side into another borough and don't have to register. So what was happening is you was getting these enclaves of paedophile communities on, the, on these canal river networks. And also children are attracted to boats. That These canals, these rivers are scarcely, sparsely policed. And a lot of children, especially from care homes, residential care homes, 
are taken on respite care on these boating holidays where they encounter paedophiles. So I was asked to look into this and I was, they were told there's two within London living on boats. If I find another two, that's brilliant. Well, within one month, I found 9090. Now, this is where conspiracies of silence come in because I was working at the time on a secondment to New Scotland Yard's paedophile unit, which I think was the first paedophile unit in the world. And I was dragged to one side by a very sort of seasoned detective who'd been on this unit since its inception and told, look, in all other uh, aspects of policing, John, if you do well, you get promoted, you get put forward to, to good jobs, you get rewarded, you get commended. When you do that in, in the criminal field of paedophilia, you get in trouble. He said, you've, you're getting too successful. He said, you need to wind it in. And he said, your name is getting mentioned in the corridors of Scotland Yard. Be very careful. Well, what was happening was names started cropping up. Names that were linked to Parliament. Names that were linked to decision-making with social services. With people linked to the police force. People high up linked to private schools. Their names are cropping up as paedophiles. Within a day, two days at most, I was dragged in by a senior officer and removed and told never to mention it again. And I was told that on two separate occasions that I'd cropped up a list of active paedophiles and on each occasion, shut down, right? And I was thinking, oh, my God, it hit me a bit hard. And, and they said, you, you can't go near these politicians. It gets shut down. They take away your funding and everyone gets threatened. So I so disgusted was that I, and I moved to the, and I was dealing with street vice. I started dealing with old prostitution, right, as it was termed back then. And it's split in, in London between the boys and the girls. This was the street scene. I was yet to find this, this child's home scene, which was mind-blowing. So you'd have the boys would be put in central London and they would be par paraded in a burger bar. And this has been going on since post-war. Young boys from care homes, young boys from four upwards into their teens, mm -hmm. in the middle of the night, paraded in central London in an area called Piccadilly. And it was called, it was termed the meat rack. And paedophiles would come and pick these boys up and take them back for sex. There's been many accounts uh, that are formed, um, been in books, been in documentaries, um, and all that, of, of well-known politicians, senior members of the military, that were involved in picking these kids as a insane a drug deal going on behind me and uh anyway so um i started working on this, going around and picking up these children and taking them to a place of safety there was other areas where young girls from the ages of nine to 14 were paraded up and down the street and when the police come they'd hide them in bushes they were not only sold on the street they would be taken to crack houses and traded they were taken to wealthy, upmarket, West End restaurants. So on one scale, these kids were traded for maybe 10 rocks in the crack houses. On the upper end, they were traded for £200 an hour and all in the same day. The one thing all these kids had in common was they were all from children's homes or broken families. This is where we see this connection a need for social depravity because it feeds this machine, you know. Now, what happened was one girl came to me and said, look, I'm being pimped out. And it was by a woman. Now, one of the things that makes me fairly unique in the podcasting child abuse community within London, anti-child abuse community, is I speak about satanic ritual abuse and its prevalence. And I speak about women paedophiles. Not many people do that, especially women paedophiles. They tend to think a paedophile 
He's a middle-aged man with big milk bottom glasses that lived with his mum and he's a bit odd. <laughs> get further from the truth, you know, paedophilia is like a knife, a hot knife through butter of the social strata. Unlike any form of criminality, it doesn't rely on, on poverty. Um, it doesn't rely on anything. There's no religious boundaries to it. There's no uh, social boundaries to this. There's no economic boundaries. But what there is, is a need to fuel this machine. And that use children from the lower echelons of city. This, this she reported that she was being pimped out twice and was just told to go away. Anyway, I listened to her. He gave me one kid, gave me another, gave me another. By the end of the week, we'd had nearly a score, nearly, nearly 20 children, right? It was getting bigger and bigger. Then names started cropping up. Magistrate from the local courts senior police officers, links to governmental buildings. And then mm. all of a sudden, I was dragged in. Yet again, within a couple of years of the, of, the, of the first warning, I was dragged in and I was told by a very, very senior officer, this guy is one of the most senior police officers in the UK. Right? And he's turned around and said, you've no idea what you're dealing with. If you mention a word of this to anyone, you'll be thrown to the effing wolves. You need to back away. This goes deeper. Now, I, I had no idea the, the real connotation of what he was saying. He was warning me of satanic ritual abuse. That's what he was warning me of. I didn't know it at the time. And maybe other people's involvement that I was working with or working under, I don't know. But... Yeah. Uh, you, you said something earlier rivaling that of any law enforcement agency even if an old age pensioner in the United Kingdom picks up a pamphlet and reads it about satanic abuse they do more than the combined efforts of all the UK police enforcement agencies there's, mm. they do nothing about it over here nothing and there's a big reason for that now what was happening with these kids was uh, some of them were going missing, never to be seen again. Some were some were dying through their injuries, so having life um, affecting, life threatening illnesses like HIV, hepatitis, contagious tuberculosis. They were all addicted to drugs. The social services network, putting to protect them, fundamentally failed them. In fact, ignored them. One little girl that I picked up. She was 14 years old. She had um, contagious tuberculosis. I'm not sure if she had HIV or not. I'm not sure. Um, she also had scabies. She was underweight for her age because she was addicted to crack cocaine and heroin. She was 14 years old. She was tiny. She looked 10 years old. I picked her up, put her in the car to take her to a place of safety, only to get a message right, from a supervising officer Get rid of her now. Dump her. And I went, why? He went, she's got scabies. She'll infect the car and infect the police station. And she's a pain in the ass. Get rid of her. tell me that if I carried on investigating the most abhorrent of crimes that he was going to take my children off me now he knew I was a single parent of four kids right now I was very scared so within two years I've had two threats right from senior officers right both involving children that are being used by people of privilege power and position and maybe parliament 
So I left them. And I went on to investigate child abuse, which is, um, pe you know, basically people abusing their kids in an emotional, physical and sexual way. So look, my first um, posting was in a very impoverished area of northeast London. And I walked in, I talked to my detective sergeant, and I said, is there a problem with child prostitution in uh, this area of London? She went, no, no. We did have an officer appointed to looking into it, but nothing cropped up in the two years she looked into it. So no, it's not a problem, and there is none of that going on in this area in two years. So I'm there. So I ring up the social services office, and I said to them, have you got a list of the children's homes in this London borough? And they went, yep, yep. They faxed it through within minutes. This is almost real time now. When this list come through, I picked up the phone. There's 23 kids' homes in this area. I picked up the first one and I said, listen, this is who I am. How many children do you have? And they said, five, between five and six. I said, how many of these children do you lose at the weekend, you know, to crime? And by crime, I mean prostitution. And, and the guy said, yeah, I know what you mean. He said, we lose at least three of them. He said, they go out on a Thursday, they come back on a Monday. They're usually very worse for wear. I said, okay, no one's in any trouble, just want to know. Within 10 minutes, I'd run up three kids' homes. And I'd found six kids within 10 minutes. So this officer, this female officer that had this position for two years, F all. Within 10 minutes, six. By the end of three days, I found 52 children. 52 children, you know, um, that were being actively pimped out. Some of them, again, with HIV, some with full-blown AIDS. One girl was so infected um, with venereal disease that her... Uh, one second. That she was bleeding pus out of her vagina. You know, it was just appalling and no one was doing anything. Now, these children's homes were getting paid um, two to two and a half thousand pounds per child per week. So for an average home, they were getting £10,000 per week to watch these children getting pimped out. This was always reported to the police and the police did nothing. And again, so I started looking into this again. Within days, I was moved on. Bang, bang, bang. So we started getting in uh, cases because of the area was in very ethnically diverse and London, you know, England is an ex-colonial nation. You know, we had a colony. I think the, the Mongolians were the only ones to rival it. And, uh, you know, a lot of people came home to roost from, from all over the place. And I started coming across voodoo, opia. Um, never came across, at this point, satanic ritual abuse. But a lot of West African, Central African and Jamaican abuse. Um, and this is where we started getting accounts of uh, the children were given, of people manifesting, their mums manifesting, pastors manifesting, uh, priestesses manifesting, and things like that. But there was never any central point of contact. There was never any database. And there was no statute offence to deal with it. So we have aggravated offences in the UK so if I punch someone in the face, that's an assault. If I punch someone in the face and call them a derogatory term relating to homosexuality, it's a homophobic assault. <laughs> there is nothing to, to define it specifically for satanic ritual abuse, sexual abuse, physical abuse, torture, kidnapping to do with, with, with SRA. Nothing. And this is what I've been pushing for for a long time. Now, at the we had a guy in the United Kingdom called Jimmy Savile. Jimmy Savile was uh, a DJ, a disc jockey. He was an ex-miner. He was an ex-wrestler. He was a TV presenter for children. He was best friends with Prince Charles. He was friends with Benjamin Netanyahu, Margaret Thatcher, our Prime Minister. Um, 
and it, it, it came out this man was a prolific paedophile. He had been reported for his abusing since the 1950s until his death, and I think circa 2010, 2011. Yep. And when he died, loads of people come forward. They were accused of carpet bagging, just making money out of it. Okay? And the one thing when dealing with, with victims of abuse, they suffer till the day they die. There is no money on this planet that will ever be a prosthetic for what they've been through. No, nothing, you know? And uh, they, so they got accused, they got denigrated. The BBC term and said, we've looked into this independently. There's nothing to see, move on. Well, luckily, that wasn't good enough for the British public. So police investigations were set up. And out of that, um, thousands came forward. But also there was information that Jimmy Savile was invo involved in satanic ritual abuse. At the same time, you had a chief constable, so like a commissioner of police, for an area of, of West England called Wiltshire. Now, Wiltshire was the residential home um, of the prime ministers, right, whoever's in. And one in particular was a man called Ted Heath. He's a guy during the 1970s, was prime minister, and he took um, England, Britain, the UK into Europe. It came out that Ted Heath, not only was he sexually abusing children, he was, he was alleged to have murdered children, and he was an active Satanist. I have spoken to many, many victims of Ted Heath, and especially one of my best friends, his brother was abused by Ted Heath. This is where you start getting government cover-ups on a major scale and whistleblowers risk their lives. This guy, this chief constable, his name is Mike Veal. He's probably the bravest policeman I've ever met in my life. He boldly stood up and he served the public well. And he said, Ted Heath, not only is a man a paedophile, he's, he is a suspected Satanist. First time we'd ever heard it. Bang. And in hearing all of this, and Jimmy Savile, right, and if combined with the fact that the main witness in, in the case against um, the child trafficking that I was investigating when I was told to shut up, right, she was found dead, this little girl, suspicious death. This girl was the bravest individual I ever come across. And I thought, whatever I go through is nothing, is a drop in the ocean, chaps, to what a child goes through when they're being abused. So I thought, well, what man am I if I ignore this? I'm not ignoring it, I'm speaking out. So I spoke out and I made allegations of corruption against some of the UK's most senior officers for covering up child prostitution. It initially was taken seriously. They afforded me um, protective witness status and they promised me, John, this is gonna be looked at at the highest level. This investigation got pushed from pillar to post. It went from the Met Police to a National Crime Agency investigation. Then it went somewhere else. Then it bounced back. And the officers that were covering it up, you know, anyone who's worked in law enforcement, the first thing you do when, when an allegation's made, right, um, you go and you arrest the suspects. Right? I'd made allegations of the highest possible nature, malfeasance in the public office against three senior UK officers. Do you know what the Metropolitan Police did? They called them up on the telephone and they said, there's the legend that you've covered child prostitution, is this true? They all went, no. So they went, okay, case closed. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. They gave me no updates. So when I went to the independent police complaints people, I said, where's the updates of my investigation? And they turned around and wrote to me and said, if you ever write to us again, we'll just throw your letters in the bin. I then went to a parliamentary minister, a member of the British Parliament, who was in charge of policing. I, he went and brought up my case. He summoned Cressida Dick, who is the, um, uh, the serving um, commissioner of the Met Police. Back then, she was an assistant commissioner. Oh, she might have been commissioner actually by this time. He went and he summoned her to, um, uh, into Parliament because he actually stood under this guy. He, the Home Secretary, you got the Prime Minister, the Home Secretary, and then these senior ministers. He was a senior minister for justice. 
and he summons the police commissioner for London into a meeting. She refused to turn up. So he took the complaint to the Home Secretary, who later on went to become um, the, the Prime Minister, Theresa May. So this minister went there, and this minister was told by Theresa May, step away from John Wedger. She told him that, and he turned around openly in Parliament, and it's a point of record, and said, if I didn't stand by John Wedger, I don't think he'd be alive today. Right, so he boldly expressed his concerns for, for my my safety, you know. Instead of investigating this crime, which is the underbelly of all criminality, 80% of all people in male prisons under 25 in the UK, 80% come from abused childhood backgrounds. 80%. Incredulous, you know. Yet they, they sparsely police this area. And when they do, it's usually with substandard detectives. And I'm going to insult a few people now. But it's usually lactating mothers, women that come back from maternity leave and they just want to go home. And there has been at least two major inquiries of police malpractice and neglect where women detectives on these child abuse have gone, not bothered to do home visits because they were frightened of taking scabies home to their little beloved children at home. Mm-hmm. Leaving the child un, you know, um, unchecked up on unsupervised that went on to die from neglect. So... And half the time on the child abuse things, I couldn't even get a car. You couldn't even get one of the, the, the pool cars to, to go and investigate. I used to use the underground trains and the buses most of the time. Right, so what happened then? I endured a three-year campaign to silence me. And this campaign resulted in nine cases being put to the Crown Prosecution. So this is like um, your prosecutors, you know, um, uh, for the police departments, the government the appointed prosecutors, um, they had nine cases put before them to, to, to put me away, to silence me. Now, bear in mind what was said to me earlier on. John, if you look into this, you're going to lose your home, your children and your job. And I'm looking at losing my job because I'm looking at prison. Right? I've got four young children at home. Right? I'm looking at losing my liberty. They was meant to, because um, I went sick, they was meant to keep me on full pay. It was classed as an injury on duty because I've been bullied in this manner. They all of a sudden put me on no pay. So for just short three years, I had no income. I was working on building sites just to, just to pay my mortgage. I couldn't pay my mortgage and a bank came to repossess my home. But luckily, the woman from the bank that they sent, she'd actually been in a children's home and she, she sided with me. And um, I paid some months, I was paying a pound a month in my mortgage just to get by, you know. Um, Mm. God God bless her. Um, Now, the worst thing happened was that one of my children, now, since I've been investigating SRA, I've nearly lost two children in very tragic circumstances, right? One of my boys um, was a victim of a very freak, life-changing, life-threatening accident. He initially died. They revived him. He spent many months in intensive care. And um, he, a couple of months into uh, his hospital treatment, all his major organs packed up. His body went into cardiac arrest and he was declared dead for 10 minutes. I was called to the hospital where I was told that my son, they managed to get a heart murmur back and a brain algorithm. They said, your son's brain dead. Um, we're going to turn the life support machine off. You've got five days with him if there's no improvement. But if there is any improvement, he's probably going to be on um, full lung inflation, which is going to destroy his lungs. His brain is damaged to the point where he's not going to recover. Right. And they said, just stay with him. But in five days, we're going to pull the plug. So I stayed um, for five days no five days say that three days by his side now in them three days i told a colleague that i was you know that i trusted look keep the police off my back tell tell my senior officer my detective inspector what's gone on and that they're not to mess with me because i'm not in a fit state you know i lose my son i'm going to be a very dangerous man right so she goes in tells a senior officer she then gets disciplined 
right, for saying that she's withholding information. I, I go every day into the chapel and I pray to Lord Jesus. And I said to Jesus, I said, listen, you want me to help these children. Children that other people can't be bothered to look after. Children that sick perverts abuse. You know, one problem I have is with the absent parent thing. It leaves a family so weak, it allows these predators, these vultures, you know, these evil, evil maggots to prey on our children. And I always speak out against single parent, albeit I was one, and I feel I'm qualified to do it. And I got angry with God. And I said, Jesus, you don't expect me to go and save anyone else's children when I lose mine. I lose my son, it's game over. I'm not helping. And I know you shouldn't challenge God or whatever, but I was angry. Anyway, I went back, sat by my son, held his hand, and he opened his eyes. Now, at that point, I knew the power of Jesus Christ. That boy went on to make what was classed as a miraculous recovery. He walked out of the hospital. He had total paralysis. He wasn't even meant to move from the nose downwards. That boy went on um, to, to father a child, get a mortgage, get engaged, and live pretty much a normal life, although he has still got such bad injuries. And I was told by the consultant, it happens every now and then, but these are classed as miraculous recoveries. And he went through. So at that point, I knew it was confirmed to me what my job was. The moment I had got home from him opening his eyes, I was exhausted, as you can imagine. When I got there, there was two police officers, two detectives, and they arrested me for child neglect, <clears throat> saying that whilst I was in the hospital, I will be in, inside in a minute, gentlemen, and you'll, you'll get better reception. Whilst, whilst I was in the hospital, I'd left my 15-year-old son home alone with my 26-year-old son. You know, so I couldn't believe it. I said, how's that home alone? That's not neglect. And they'd been dispatched by the commissioner of the Metropolitan Police to arrest me. So bear in mind the threats that were made against me for exposing, you know, the child trafficking, the loss of my job, well, that was going to happen. You know, the loss of my home, well, that was pretty much on its way. Now the loss of children. They tried to take one of my children into care. Anyway, stood up and I fought back. At that point, I was, it hurt me too much. And they started to back down. And then every single case they, they had against me in court collapsed and was thrown away. Right. Um, I managed to get um, my money reinstated and I managed to secure my pension. But that allowed me then to speak out. So I started going out and thinking I can use the skills that I've got as an investigator, as an interviewer, to, to talk to victims and survivors of abuse because it was starting to leak out. But the press were, were managing it to a certain degree that it was perverting justice. So I, I teamed up with a guy called Bill Maloney. He was a survivor of a care home. There was nine of them in children's homes, uh, his siblings. And he was one of the only surviving ones arrested, died through suicide and through drug addiction. And he, this man spoke with such fortitude, um, you know, and anger. And me and him together, we started going up and down the country, um, speaking out. And it was from there, um, I was introduced to Wilfred Wong. And Wilfred Wong is probably the bravest man I've ever met. He's not a very big guy. He's um, got a, a, an incredibly good rep professional reputation behind him. He's an ex-military guy. He, he's an ex-barrister. He's an ex-lobbyist in Parliament. And he campaigns tirelessly for um, uh, victims of satanic ritual abuse. And he started then talking to me about SRA. And Bill Maloney, the guy that I was doing stuff with, he said that his sister recalls being taken out of the children's homes at night, being taken to wooded areas where people all in cloaks would stand round, and she ended up with stab wounds all over her body. Wilfred started really, really sort of educating me to what was going on and the fact that this has got a spiritual element to it. 
so I started interviewing victims and survivors of satanic abuse. And you can pretty much divide them down the middle between those that have been abused, sexually abused in the care homes. And I want to go on, if I have the time, gentlemen, as to why it's so prolific within the United Kingdom. Because there is a political reason for this as well. And those that have been satanically abused. And the satanic abuse, the victims and survivors, have a thing called DID disassociated identity disorder and it used to be called multiple personalities and what it does it fractures their minds you know and there's there's one girl that has given me so much information on this she's got over 100 different personalities and they're all given like childish names so she'll have one called sparky one called drippy and they're all got these names but what they relate to is the ways in which the kids are tortured so the kids might be tortured. Electrocution is one way. Drowning is another way. Um, suffocation. And they bring these children to the point of death when they abuse them, when they sexually abuse them. Now, the reason that they, um, they, they do this to these children, if you just bear with me two seconds, I'll get my, my other keys and I can put my phone on charge and sit in some sort of... Um, it, all, it, all it is is because of the time delay... I was an hour out, and um, okay. you know, so I'm just going to sit in my van and I'll get All right, some pizza. John, give us 30 seconds. Go ahead and do what you got to do. I want to go back to Doug just real quick. Yeah. Doug, do you have a break that you have to do right now? Um, Eric, the tech. Should we do a break? Uh, we can. Can we? Should we? G- give me a sign. Yeah. Okay. Um, that way we can reset things uh, if necessary. Russ, uh, thank you very much. Okay. Um, John, John Wedger, yep. um, uh, thank you as you get resituated. Thank you. And, and I would tell people, it's my understanding that John is walking because of, um, to get back to his home because of, uh, an issue with his vehicle that, uh, shall we say was not, um, well, not a regular mechanical issue. I think Michael Hastings, uh, with a satanic twist. Such information in the last, uh, in the, from 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 John, uh, two incredible people with me, Russ Dizdar, John Wedger, folks. You're listening to the Hagman Report on the Global Star Radio Network on this very important program. Please spread this around to everyone you know and people you don't know. Get it right back. Stay right where you're at. This is the Hagman Report, hour number two, with very special guests Russ Dizdar and John Wedger from London, UK. John, just so people know, uh, John Wedger is a retired police detective with over 25 years of service in the investigation of, into child abuse. He is one of the foremost experts in, in that arena, in that area, and he has suffered over the last... Uh, uh, especially over the last couple of days, a lot of intense threats. And uh, it, it, I mean, folks, you know, people say, well, I, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll do this or we can do, uh, I'm going to tell you something. You sign on to this, you sign on to something you've got no idea what you're signing on to. And, and of course, the uh, uh, somebody I love dearly, uh, Russ Dizdar, I have an immense amount of respect for him and, and every member of his team. Uh, knows that very well himself, having uh, the same yeah, kind of treatment. And, you know, we just passed, as John mentioned, summer solstice. Well, you didn't hear it, but the summer solstice, uh, that's got specific meaning. But I'm not going to take any more time up. I'm going to kick it over to Russ Dizdar, shatterthedarkness.net. All of the links, including and especially John Wedger Foundation, will be in the program description box. I urge everyone to click on the links, including Russ and John. And uh, folks, f- reach in down deep and support these gentlemen. I mean, support them like, like your life depends on it because theirs does and yours might. And with that, Russ Dizdar. Thank you, Doug. And thank you again for having uh, us on. Thank you for John because... 
you know, we do have the good news is in the United States, we, we, we have a lot of new folks on the field, more and more books being written. And I just mentioned that I did 30, I think 38 hours, uh, 38 days of radio broadcast on updating and, and trying to give content, uh, links to places, books, um, things like that to get really educated about it. As you're see, as you're listening to John, I don't know if it moved. I, I I don't see how it can't move anybody, because when I talk to individuals who have boots on the ground that, that have gotten it, it's one thing to go in and pick up a little girl that looks like she's ten and she's fourteen and try to take her somewhere to get help. It's another thing to begin to report and say, "Hey, this involves a ring of individuals. This involves people that might be up in government." Um, and so when I was in Scotland, John, and we were all over talking to individuals at different places in Dundee and so forth, I kept hearing from all these individuals, Russ, don't say this out loud. Uh, Russ, let me turn in the hotel. Let's turn you this way. So the CCTV can't see you. Cause I, I, we don't want them to see, we don't want them to hear that what you're talking about. And I was really kind of astounded. I mean, over here we have we've we've gone to the feds, we've gone to troopers, we've gone to sheriffs, we've we've um, we've tried to do a lot to go in that direction. We're going to an attorney general with another packet of information. Um, we um, so we're going so we know opposition here. There's no question about that. Uh, we know when they come to the house, when they've done you know things to attack, they're going to come and take your daughter. All those kind of things we understand, John. But in the UK. And I left, when I left Scotland and came back, I told everybody, it's actually far worse in my estimation. And I'm, I'm saying I'm after facts and evidence and, and, uh, we don't need any fabrication. We don't need any fake stuff. And we need to get down to the facts because of how many young people in human trafficking and pedophilia and then satanic ritual abuse. And it's all connected. It comes down again to the, the major abuses of young people and, and the, and the uh, the sheer numbers, how broad it's become. The Jimmy Savile case was big, and it seemed to be squashed. And uh, and and so when I when I when I was in Scotland and talking to everybody, and then talking with Wilford Wong, and we flew Wilford Wong over here to speak at a conference here, and everybody loved the content and the factualness that he brought to us. But in the UK, John, I guess my question is. Like when I was in Scotland, we went at Dundee, we went to a little mall, a little shopping center mall down the street. They had huge signs up, billboards that said, help Scotland find its missing kids. So oh, yeah. in, all, in all of what you want to say, let me ask you about, it seems as though, and I, I was trying to read a lot of content this week, that not only is there a high level of child abuse, pedophilia, and, and then now the, the satanic side of all of that, but... And a lot of victims that aren't getting the kind of help they need, but there seems to be um, a, a lot of um, the, the the governmental side or upper law enforcement or, or folks that are in power that are really active in silencing all this. Can you tell us why and tell us yeah. about the miss, missing kids? Yeah. Um, the moment you mentioned satanic abuse, you're in a totally different world, you know? The, the police will not acknowledge it goes on. You mentioned about Scotland here, Russ. Yeah. When, when I trained as a, a, a child abuse detective, part of the training manual, they do go on about a case in the Orkney Islands, which is this cluster of islands very, very northeast of Scotland that are nearer to Norway than they are to Scotland, in which there was um, actual conviction for satanic ritual abuse. Wilfred Wong cites about 10 cases within recent years of satanic ritual abuse that, that have um, attained a conviction in our Crown Court system. But again, it's always a conviction for rape, for, for torture, for, uh, right. for assault, with a, a satanic or negative religious connotation. Um, we have a massive West African population over here. Um, we, voodoo is very active. It's very active within the criminal world. We, this is where the connections start being made between organised criminals, members of government, uh, high ranks in echelons of the police, and it all closes down. There was a children's home on the islands of Jersey. Now, again, 
the, the UK loves their islands. You know, we've got a lot of overseas dependent um, islands. There was cases um, in the Ascension Islands, which are off the uh, southwest coast of Africa, uh, a British island. If you went there, it, it would be like being in the UK, but with tropical weather. There was sexual abuse going on there involving the Attorney General, uh, mm. involving satanic abuse. The officers that went out to investigate were sent back home. Uh, the social services worker was arrested. We had the, the uh, Canal Islands, which are off the coast of um, northwest France. Again, British islands, uh, British dependency. And there was uh, cases children were staying in a children's home called Hope de la Garenne, where they were taken to a basement area where there were rituals went on and children were murdered. Um, the basement had been filled up with slurry and the, the children were just put in mental homes. So what you'll find with these children's homes, this is the cottage industry, it's the children's homes. You know, there is a big business of children. We've got a very dysfunctional society and there's an endless supply of children to feed these perverts. People abuse children for one reason, because they want to. Satanic abuse is a bit more complex because it is a Satanist job to push demons into people and they do it, they give the demons a home by raping these children and pushing it in. Now, these kids in Jersey, these islands, you can't run. You're stuck there. Another very brave officer called Lenny Harper came from um, Strathclyde Police, uh, which was up by Glasgow. He got seconded out to the Channel Islands. And a, a bizarre situation in the Channel Islands. It, it's actually one of the fewest places on the world that has a feudal system, right, which means the landowners have right of law. So the, the wealthy landowners... Their children instantly become warranted police officers without any training. Very, very strange. But as well, you get a professional trained police force. They work together. They use the same comm system and they work at the same buildings. He said one of these, um, there's a name for them. They, they, they get um, given a special title. Uh, one of them was a convicted paedophile. He'd actually done time for rape and he was a warranted police officer. The Met Police has just reinstated a senior officer, a superintendent called Robin Williams, the, the girl's Robin with a Y. She was caught with a child porn video involving a five-year-old child. Right, She was convicted. She served a community service order for possession of child pornography. Um, and she had to register as a, a sex offender until 2024. She's now been reinstated in her job by the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, the same one, Chris Dick, I mentioned earlier, as a convicted paedophile, <laughs> right? This guy called Lenny Harper went out to the Channel Islands to investigate this. Exactly the same thing happened to him. He was attacked. He was threatened, you know, by people on the government level, right? He excavated this, this basement area. He found blood. He took along an anthropologist and an archaeologist where they said rituals went on where kids were murdered. He found skulls. The anthropologist, the archaeologist found them. The anthropologist turned around and said, this is the skull of, a, of an infant child. It's got collagen on it. The cadaver dog verified it. The bone was sent off for the official forensication, forensic analysis, right? When the bone come back, it was in the unique seal strap that was put on the um, on the bag. So you'll never get another, like DNA, you'll never get another same. He said it was the same number, but a different manufacturer's seal had been put on the bag. And the result was it was coconut shell. Right? The investigation was shut down. They discredited him. He was removed off the island. But at the same time, this is how connected it is. The cadaver dog, they couldn't discredit it, right? Because it... it you know, it's irrefutable evidence, although, you know, it's a very strange um, premise of law, but that's its job. And it picked up that that was human collagen, human bone, right? We're the only animal to have it. I think a pig might do as well, but it was not um, coconut shell. This dog was eventually, di eventually discredited by a couple called Jerry and Kate McCann, who had a, a child called Madeline McCann who went mm -hmm. missing. Great. It's a big case over here. There was links to the Prime Minister, Gordon Brown. The Pope went out 
And she, Kate McCann, discredited the cadaver dog because a cadaver dog put the finger on her and her husband for having um, a dead body, a corpse in their car. She managed to discredit that dog. And then that dog was discredited later on in Hotel Garen. It shows how interconnected it is. Mm. With our political scene, right? We've had, I think, the last five prime ministers have had political advisors who have had links to paedophilia. You know, one of them was a guy called Patrick Rock. I think he was Tony Blair's political advisor. He was a cast as a dangerous paedophile. Mm. We've had a man called um, Sir Peter Hay. Um, that was connected to Margaret Thatcher. He was in, in charge of our intelligence services. He was a convicted paedophile. We started seeing journalists who started reporting on satanic ritual abuse getting served with things called D notices, right? D notices shuts them up. Mm-hmm. No one, people go, there's a D notice served on them. They've got to shut their mouth. Well, what is a D notice? And I explain to people, D notice is a defense notice. It can be used by the military intelligence services. It can only be used by the military intelligence services, which is MI5 and MI6. It was brought in during the First World War to stop um, spy talk, you know, to stop people talking. You know, they said loose lips sink ships. Uh, They serve this military intelligence tool on journalists who report on satanic ritual abuse. We had our Home Secretary, Leon Britton, who was handed files by a, by a politician called Jeffrey Dickens. Jeffrey Dickens was a politician um, in the uh, Manchester area, um, in the Saddleworth area of Northern England. Jeffrey Dickens was a friend of Wilfred Wong's. Jeffrey Dickens had a list of cases of satanic ritual abuse which involved politicians. He handed it to the Home Secretary, Leon Britton, who I was told about on two separate occasions, right? Uh, has been involved in paedophilia. Leon Britton lost the files. They went missing. They lost. And then Jeffrey Dickens was discredited. The Chief Constable Mike Veal, who exposed Ted Heath as being a paedophile and a Satanist, he was attacked, discredited, and told to stood down by the intelligence services in the House of Lords. Mm. Right? We, we had politicians from the Labour government that were, that were allowing a pro-paedophile group during the 1980s to speak at the national conference. This group was called PI, Paedophile Information Ex- Exchange. It was linked to NAMBLA, which you have over in the US, the North American Boy Lovers Association. And it was made up of pro-paedophiles that wanted um, sex between, I think, a four-year-old boy and a man to be made consensual. And a 13-year-old girl and a man, you know, whether an adult to be made consensual. And we had three politicians that were back in this group. And one of these politicians went on to be made Minister for Child Welfare. You know, a member of PI, he, um, his name is Sir Peter Wrighton. He ended up writing the doctrine for how children are dealt with in social care. You know, these are very, very sick, perverted, paedophile-protecting, satanically-linked individuals. A a, a list came out called the RAINS list. It's an acronym. Mm -hmm. And and I would advise anyone globally to look in this list. It stands for Ritual Abuse Information Network Support. It was set up by a a, uh, psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, called Dr. Joan Coleman, again, a good friend of Wilfred Wong. We haven't got to scratch our heads too long to realise why Wilfred's been banged up in prison, you know. Mm-hmm. Wilfred was the soldier that was exposing this, you know. You know, I, I've done my bit and many others. There's people that have died exposing this. The Reigns List is, is a 16-page document which takes some believing. It's never been discredited. It's been attacked. It's not been discredited. People were coming to this hospital in South London uh, to see this Dr. John Coleman for therapy for, for conditions such as DID. They never used to really recognize it. They used to call it multiple personalities, right? And she started thinking, uh, or started recognizing that there's consistencies with these people. 
and it's this DID that were different to normal victims of sexual abuse. And they started all saying the same things, that they were taken to rituals, they, they were abused, there was um, like a church setting going on, and they are used, these children in these rituals, they are used to kill other children. I've spoken to one woman who was, they, they sellotaped, they gaffer taped a knife like a letter opener to her hand. There was five babies were placed on this altar. This was in a very famous film studios outside of London. And she told me in during this ritual that she had to use this, uh, she was a little girl, five years old. It was, it was taped to her hand and she had to insert this, this long prong steel knife opener into the vaginas of these little babies and kill everyone one by one while groups were chanting and masturbating. You know, and, and I have heard account after account. This range list, if more than two people, so the minimum of three people, mentioned a person or a place, it went on the list. This list names politicians. It named someone that was in charge of the unit, the vice unit that I was working on in the Metropolitan Police, right? His name is on this list. I have spoken to prostitutes that were asked to go on the street to get runaway kids to sell them to senior officers that were linked to this officer, right? The, the former cardinal for the Catholic Church for the UK is on this list. There are Jimmy Savile's on this list. There are celebrities. There are military personnel. There are priests. It goes on and on and on. And it has been verified, this list. It is the most incredible document. I wrote to the police complaints and to Parliament and said, everyone named on this, it was linked to law enforcement. There's three police officers on there. They need to be arrested, investigated, and their pensions put on hold. Again, I was told, shut your mouth. We're not listening to you. I know one woman handed it. She was running a charity. She handed it to David Cameron. Within days, her charity was shut down. They know about this. The commissioner of police knows about this. There was a guy called Robert Green, a good friend, again, of myself and Wilfred's. He exposed a satanic paedophile ring involving Down syndrome kids. that had a link to, to um, a well-known um, Scottish minister who stood trial for rape, right? Um, he handed the list to a politician and it was handed again to David Cameron, our Prime Minister. Again, nothing is done. It is pure, pure Satanism in your face. They worship the same demons. When you look at demonology, when you look at what is worshipped in Santeria, in Opia, in, in, in Voodoo, you know, in, in satanic abuse, they all worship the same nine levels of demons. These right. demons have all got their same jobs to do and then they're allocated to certain people, certain rituals are done and these children are raped in the names of these demons to give their home to these demons and unless they're delivered and unless they're dealt with, they're tormented throughout their lives and it is sad when you meet survivors of satanic abuse that are unresolved and they are multipled and it breaks your heart because they've done mm. nothing wrong. And they have to live with this. Sex with animals. I've heard of manifestations. And one woman, she turned around to me. she become a high-class prostitute. And she told me she was flown to different military. Military bases always crop up. Always, always crop up. Mm -hmm. You know, a few police stations have cropped up. But this woman turned around. And she's a third person to warn me. And, and she turned around. She said, this will have a lot to do with the United Kingdom's Ministry of Defence. Third person mm. to tell me that, one senior police officer said to me, John, I worry for your safety. This goes right to the heart of the British establishment. Mm. This, is the glue, this is the glue that holds everything together in the UK. You have never come up against a conspiracy of silence until you investigate satanic abuse. Mm. You know, you're either destroyed, discredited, or you're done away with. Yeah. And it is a very real problem. And we ignore this at the peril of our next generation. John, tell us about um, 
Tell us about the response of counsel. Is there a lot of help for victims? Is there anybody helping? What do the church? What does the church do? Uh, what's well, the response this, of the church? This is really interesting, Russ, because um, I'm a soldier for Jesus Christ, yeah. right? I go to the church. I'm the only non-African now. I love the way the black community pray because they, they they're, they're warriors. I've, I was brought up a Catholic. I've been in Catholic churches, and my I, I mean they're redundant. They're redundant when it comes to prayer. I spoke to the head exorcist um, for the Catholic Church who's been doing it for 60, 62 years. He's now retired. And he said when I, he started exorcisms way back, God knows when, through, after the war, I don't know when. The guy is in his 80s now, but very early on in, in his uh, um, priesthood. He said there was two of us, and one of them, he said he wasn't really bothered. He said, there's now 60, and the, and the Vatican can't recruit enough. You've got right. pastors that are doing deliverance day in, day out. They are, they are in, in, inundated with it, you know. I went, I wrote to the Cardinal, a guy called Vincent Nichols, and who, again, has been heavily criticized by the government inquiry, in, independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, in which I gave evidence for covering this up. He turned around and ignored me. And it was only pressure from other Catholics who said, give John, you know, the voice, an audience at least. So I said, as my spiritual leader, what are you going to do to help me combat evil that is abusing our children? So he said, come and see me. So I went to a meeting. He then, his secretary then said he was on holiday and couldn't attend. But his deputy, a bishop called Paul McAleen, who has also been criticised on numerous occasions by not just the Independent Inquiry, but the National British Press for covering up child abuse um, and frustrating investigations. He said, oh, well, I'll see you. So as I went to the main cathedral in, in London, as I walked in, I bumped into the Cardinal, who was meant to be on holiday. <laughs> anyway, I go in there and I start talking to this bishop and I explain my story and what I'm doing. And he turned around and he, all he did was discredit and attack and denigrate the children who, and the adults, sorry, who had come forward um, as victims of childhood abuse um, and had reported the former prime ministers of Ted Heath. So he attacked Ted Heath's victims and said that they had denigrated a good a man's good name, a good man's good name. And I stood up and I said, I, you can't help me. And as I walked out the door, I said to him, I said to him, do you know what, Paul? And I'm not calling him father. He don't deserve it, you know. There's only one father, and that's Jesus, you know. I said, you know what, Paul? I've sat here Catholic to Catholic. I've opened my heart and told you what I've endured in, in, in giving a voice to the voiceless. And not once have you even offered to pray for me. Shame on you. Shame mm. on you. You know, and it was, a, there's a guy in America who's an ex-wrestler who does a lot of deliverance, and he's quite well known. He does a lot of podcasts. Um, his name will come to me again. He's an, a, a real ex-street fighter, um, always doing podcasts. Doing it. In the end, he, he rang me that night, and he prayed with me. Mm. You know, he did a prayer with me, you know. Yeah. And, and so so they, they've got no interest, no interest whatsoever. The other thing we've got to look at is how many institutions, ch children's institutions, these sprung up all across the UK in the late 18th century, right, these children's homes. And they were either philanthropists or the church that, you know, or, or wealthy businesses or organisations that set these things up, okay? 80% of, of, of Catholic um, denominations of Catholicism in the UK do not answer to the Vatican. So we were getting things like the brothers, De La Salle brothers, were setting up children's homes, right? They were not, they were self-governing, so the government wouldn't intervene. Everyone assumed that the Catholic faith was making sure that there was fair play. There wasn't, and they didn't even have to, 80% of them didn't even have to answer to the Vatican. They were just doing nothing but raping and pimping out boys. Two, two brothers twin brothers were, were taken into this care home in, in Northern Ireland, a Catholic care home, uh, in which was run by the Dulesau brothers. The first night they were held down by the priests and made the, boy, the other boys were made to rape them. 
They were then taken to parties in which they were members of the paramilitaries in Northern Ireland, because bear in mind in Northern Ireland had virtually a civil war going on. There was businessmen and there were priests all sitting around masturbating while they made these twin brothers rape each other. You know, so when you get um, people that have gone through that abuse, that they've been made to perform oral sex, give priest blowjobs, and then the Bible is read out to them, and then the priest is seen to give communion an hour later, how can you tell them people to go to the church and to pray to God for deliverance from the devil? They ain't going to do it. They're going to tell you where to go. You can go away. And this is what they do. They push people away from God. Anyone who hides beyond the name of Jesus Christ to abuse a child, man, you know, they go to a special place in hell. The right. church, yeah. I've sat I've sat in meetings, and I'm going to give you an example. This is a very good example, Russ, and a very good question. I went to Parliament. I've given evidence and spoken in, in the Houses of Parliament, um, may, may, I don't know, a dozen times, may, maybe more, you know? And I was called to one to speak as my role as a whistleblower against the police, because bear in mind, the police, especially the Metropolitan Police, when I was silenced, never investigated another case of child prostitution for the next eleven year, the next seven years until Jimmy Savile was exposed, right? Mm. And, and that's deliberate, you know? Right. Now, the, the churches are post-Jimmy Savile. They had this meeting in Parliament where they had heads of all the major faiths were there to stand up. Safeguarding officers were sent in to speak about what they are doing to protecting children in their faith, right? So I went along and I gave my speech as a whistleblower. And I said, a whistleblower is like a victim and a survivor. When you stand up, one thing happens. You stand alone. No one stands with you. You look around for your friends, they're all gone. You know, you know when you stand, you stand alone. Yeah. Right? So I give this speech. Then it went through. So the Hindu faith, they got their, their safeguarding guy was telling what the Hindus are doing to prevent their religious leaders raping children. The Catholics have come under the hardest attack, I would say. Um, but are, are they the worst? Probably they're no different from any of the others. It's just that they've been hit the hardest, you know, and exposed the most. They have actually done more than any other major faith to address this. this they have, you know. It went on. I was disgusted because the rabbi turned around and denied it went on in his faith, and which sort of knocked me for six. And I thought, well, that's a lie for a start. Um, and then what had happened is the Anglican Church, the Church of England, hadn't sent a priest. It hadn't, because it had seen the guest list, the speaker's list. It had sent an advocate, a solicitor, right? And they made their apologies, and they, but there was a legal representative. Bit odd, bear in mind, we're in England, it's the Church of England, you know? The yeah. major faith, we're a Protestant Christian country, mm. right? A lot of abuse went on in the Anglican care homes, right? But an imam stood up, right? <laughs> this guy stood up and he said, I want to, I want to address my speech to, to the, the, the police officer, the detective. John, he said, John, speaking out is about speaking the truth, isn't it? I said, yes, it is. Yes, it is, my brother, it is. He said, well, I'm going to speak the truth. And I am. And as he went to open his mouth, the, the Anglican Church, the Church of England solicitor stood up and he warned this guy, if he continues to speak in the manner he's intending, there will be legal ramifications. Right, and he was thinking, "What? What's that about?" The imam looks at me, and he says, "We have to say the truth in the in the name of God." I said, "Yes, brother, we do." He then points at, at the um, at the solicitor, and he said, "Bishop so and so made me suck his cock." Right? Wow, man, you could have had a pin. It was, and I. Looked up, I ran up to this imam and I hugged him. I said, God bless you, my brother. And that was it. This guy started screaming and shouting, 
write this this solicitor. How dare you say this? How dare you? He did this to me. He ruined my life. And now I, as an imam, will do everything to protect any child under my jurisdiction from being abused by an imam. Right? This guy, oh man, I loved him. Mm. Two days later, he rings me up, this imam. He wants my number. He said, John, I've been arrested. I said, what do you mean you've been arrested? He said, I've been arrested perverting the course of justice. They, they've reminded me and they put me before court and I've been bailed out. I've got to go back in a week's time. I said, why? He said, because of what I said in, in Parliament. He said, it turns out that the advocate, the solicitor, the lawyer that they, uh, 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 they'd sent, it was his, his brother was a guy who abused me. His brother is also the chaplain, in charge of the chaplaincy for the Metropolitan Police. You couldn't make it up. And yeah. I said, my brother, I'm coming to call on your behalf. I'm standing with you. And he said, look, they've offered to give me a, a, a caution. I said, but you get that. You can't work. You can't, you know, you've got a strike against your name. The betting won't allow you to continue doing your work because you've got a conviction. Because you'll get a criminal records bureau check. It will stop him working in that capacity. Mm -hmm. And he said, what do I do? I said, you fight it. I'll come. I'll stand. I'll stand by your side fight it and he did bless him this man mm. went to court and they threw the case out mm. this goes to show how this network works we haven't even gone into the realms of freemasonry and the influence of freemasonry will have you know yeah. when you break that down that is just another strand of satanism that has a huge huge major major influence on policing yeah. I've worked in offices where it's been the majority have been Freemasons. I'm not knocking individual Freemasons. You know, I work with them. I've got friends that are them. I don't think some of them fully understand what they're doing. Right. But there was, there was one guy. I started my detective training with him. We were training detectives together. He was an Asian guy. In Asia, you know, I think... You, you deal with the far east. We deal with our Asians or Indians and Pakistanis, you know? Mm -hmm. And this guy, a Pakistani guy, and they wouldn't let him um, become a detective, you know? It was so difficult for him, you know? He really had to try hard. They didn't want him in there, you know? So he was offered this olive branch, and it was join the Freemasons. Yeah. So he joined the Freemasons. Boom. His career skyrocketed. And he, he said, to me, John, I'm detective now he ended up working on the um real high high-tech crime unit he ended up working in california he went everywhere globally this guy mm. went everywhere and he started his friends were here his friends were there my career was nose diving <laughs> this was skyrocketing right mm. i see him nine years later and he comes up to me and he said can we go and have a beer said, yeah of course you know i haven't seen him for ages it was lovely to see him he said, uh, did, did you get in the Masons? I went, no. He said, don't, don't, whatever you do, get in the Masons. He said, it's devil worship. I went, but you was loving it the other day. He said, you know, you'll have a year when I saw you, you know? He said, John, you don't realize it, but once you get to a certain degree, it's devil worship. It is devil worship, mm -hmm. you know? There is no two ways about it, you know? And, and it has a major, major influence. When, when I whistle blew, I, I said to the uh, anti-corruption command, I turned around and said, I'm prepared to talk. And I said, but I want to talk to a senior woman officer. And they went, why? And I said, because that's what I want. Right. So they send me a very young uh, uniformed police officer. And I said, I ain't talking to you. I ain't talking to you. You go back. The information I got is very, very high up and very confidential. I want a senior woman detective. In the end, I get a call from a detective chief inspector, a woman. Anyway, she said, look, uh, John, I'll, I'll talk to you. I'll come and, you know, come and see, come and see me. Come to my office. So I had to go to a, a secure location. Right. It's on what they call a secure corridor. No one can get in there. This is the top anti-corruption command. On my way up there, a guy jumps in the lift with me. He's one of the inspectors that was on the unit that I'm now reporting against and starts talking to me against the officer I'm about to report and trying to 
coerced me out of it. And I thought, well, what's, what, how's that happened? Anyway, I didn't say anything to him. I said, I'm not here to discuss it with you. I'm, you know, good luck with your career. When I went in, this senior woman officer, she said, why is it you stipulated these regulations? I said, Chris, because you cannot roll up your trouser leg. And she thought about it, and then she laughed. She said, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. And, you know, the inference, because that's what the Freemasons do, the rolled up trouser leg brigade and everything else, mm -hmm. they would wear little badges, very discreet little badges. One of them was um, a, a cartoon character called Rupert the Bear. Um, and it's a, this little bear with tart and trousers, but they wear this little tiny badge. And when you looked at the bear, he had his he's got his left trouser leg rolled up. And, you know, so very, very little subtleties you would see with these people, yeah. very connected, and, you know, you're up against them. And when you make disclosures, they're going to have access to everything. So if you think that Freemasonry is a secret society, you know, not to be trifled with, what do you think Satanism is then? I mean, it's the ultimate, the ultimate secret society. Yeah. You know, it's the ultimate conspiracy of, of silence. You know, there are no bystanders in Satanism. You know, mm. you're not right. there to, to go and take, once you're in, you're fully in. This one um, lady comes to me because I was dealing with runaway children. You know, this is where it's important for us as Christians to put across strong family values. We have this baby mother, baby father culture, which has its inception in the colonial days when the slaves were taken away deliberately from, from their children so there was no bond. So it becomes prominent within the black communities. The Jamaican influence it's had over here, and, and, and again, this ain't no racing, this is a factual thing. We have to get away from this baby mother, baby father culture. You know, the, the lioness must always protect her cubs. We've mm -hmm. got a very, very dysfunctional society which leaves these children vulnerable. They get put into these children's homes and they are then preyed on. We've got kids that run away from home and they have Satanists. There is a, a ladder, there is a pyramid of power. Right, and I do a talk on this. Mm. At the bottom, you have these spotters. Their job is to go out within these troubled uh, urban areas, whatever areas, and identify weak families who aren't looking after their children. You know, mm -hmm. they go mm -hmm. up to the next level, which are the fixers, which are people that will have access to records, to social services records, medical records, or where children that are in care homes, they will know the children whose parents visit and the nose are done. And these are the children that they will then prey on, right? So right. you get children that are intergenerational. They are born into Satanism. They are a higher commodity. because. But the thing is with them, they live. They will live. They are sexualized. They are demonized from a very early age. They are put through near-death experiences. They are preyed upon. They are put rituals on. They are made to kill other children, you know, they, they will be demonized and they will, this is the job to pass these demons on. These demons need a home and this is what they do. The mm. children that are taken from the care homes and the institutions and the runaways that are identified by these fixers, they die. They are, they are dispensable kids, you know. They mm. are just a commodity. People pay a lot of money. I heard of two very well-known gangsters in the UK that were charging for parties £40,000 for a child. This was way back, you know, uh, in the 60s and that. Um, but that's what they were charged for a child. And they, they weren't bothering to retrieve the child. Mm. And the inference being that that child was just abused to death. Politicians, yeah. all sorts are involved, you know. Yeah. So, so these kids have a place. It's a very well organised. And then you'll have cleaners. Cleaners will come in and make sure that the area is forensically clean. They, mm. they, I, I was told of a very high-ranking police officer who I know, who is a cleaner for the south, uh, southeast area of England. They're based on regional areas. So venues that are chosen, this is where it's difficult, and it's been difficult for Wilfred to walk in and find a, um, a ritual going on, right? Mm. Yeah. 
on, on, on a spiritual level, they are going to have these remote viewers that are knowing if you're coming. You know, it's going to mm -hmm. happen. They're going to have these spiritual centuries that are going out, making sure, and anyone with the intention of going in there, they're going to go out and distract them and make mm -hmm. sure they don't. They will have physical centuries that, that will go out with dogs and everything else to, to prove. I've been with Wilfred Wong in the dead of night at a known site um, for Satanism, and a guy came out with a Doberman dog. We laid flat on the ground, you know, at two, three in the morning, and this bloke, actually, the dog never even detected us. Just laid there, and he just said, I mean, this guy has got nerves of steel. My heart was bang, 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 bang. These guys are going to get us. they got dogs, you know. And I was a serving policeman at the time, you know, thinking, oh, my word. And he just said, just stay still, stay still, pray. And we prayed, and this dog walked past. So they have that. But, you know, then they'll have... And so if you've got a venue, they've got to make sure that you don't... A central station alarm isn't triggered, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So they have to yeah. be disabled. They've got to make sure the police aren't called because if there's screams or lights going on in... We've got things like working men's clubs, like bars for, for ex-servicemen and things like that that have been named. Yeah. Salvation Army uh, places, which are, um, again, benevolent organisations that do charitable work. Their venues have been called. Churches have been named. Police social clubs, police accommodation buildings have all been named as venues. So you've got to make sure that they're not interrupted. Yeah. And also you've got to make sure that these places are forensically cleaned afterwards. Mm -hmm. You know, there is no check. You've got to make sure that people don't double park mm -hmm. and call parking issues. So, you know, sorry about mm -hmm. that. Uh, stay with me. So there, there are all these factors that need to be taken on. Yeah. And these are the cleaners that do that. And then you go up. That you, gentlemen, you're going to have to stay with me, but it's just because no someone's calling me. Sure. I just have to I just have to decline their, their uh, call. That's all. But then the, these children are, are then taken in for these rituals by the people that pay money for them. So I was told that sometimes you'll get a visiting dignitary will stipulate that they want a little white ginger-haired boy. So they'll go and, and source one. They might want a little black boy. They might want a little Indian girl. They might, whatever they want, they're yeah. going to get. And then they will have, these other spotters will be put out to make sure that, they, they use kids sometimes to watch on street corners to make sure mm. no one comes, everything else. Yeah, and so it's very, very, very highly organised. I knew one woman; she was a street prostitute, and her job was to go out and pick up kids for sex parties for the Satanists. But they weren't killing them; they were just having sex with them, paying them, giving them drugs, and dumping them back. But she tells a very interesting story because it dovetails into my work on Vice in Central London with the Runaway Boys on the meat rack that I mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. And and she said, I was a heroin addict. I come from the care home from sexual abuse. One day, two gentlemen approached me and they said, come to a party. They both had sex with me. And they, she said, they gave me heroin. Very posh. And mm -hmm. they said, listen, you've got free heroin from now on. We just need you to do one thing. She said, okay, what is it? So they gave her a train ticket and they told her to go to an area again, Wilfred Wong talks about this area all the time. And, and if you ever watch the videos of a, a lady called Jeanette Archer, who I'd interviewed, Jeanette Archer was, was um, intergenerational family, abused, uh, witnessed atrocities with children. There's a place to the southwest of London called Surrey. Surrey. This, and it's a, it's a borough, it's a county. Again, I want to go on about freedom of information, the police's attitude to all this in a minute. Um, Surrey is like an epicenter of satanic ritual abuse. There's an area called Virginia Water, um, which is a very posh area. The stockbrokers live there. You've got the, the British Army's Military Academy there. You've mm -hmm. got some very important um, military establishment and policing establishments down there. Mm -hmm. right? Right. She, was, she was told to go there. She went there. A car picked her up, this prostitute, took her to, to this, it was a church, late at night, went in this church, locked the door, it was a satanic ritual going on. Mm. She said they killed a baby in front of her, got the blood, got her to drink the blood, she drank the blood, and she said after that she became become instantly psychic. Mm. Instantly. 
Um, yeah, and everything went her way. And she said, so whenever a ritual was occurring, I didn't need to be collected, told or informed, yeah. you know, or contacted. She said, I spiritually knew where to go. Mm. She said, everyone had to drink the blood. So the moment they drink the blood of that child, it's all about blood. Blood is a lifeline, so is semen. Semen is a DNA. Again, semen is, is, is very powerful. Mm. Blood is used. Blood is used a lot in the voodoo rituals. They take the right. blood of a child, and from there they've got the DNA, and they can manipulate that person spiritually. Yep. Hospitals, we hear of abattoirs, abortion clinics, all the, the same things again and again and again, and we see the, hear the same thing of the police covering it up covering yeah. it up and it was Surrey police that were first told about Jimmy Savile mm. Surrey police wow. and they covered up so what I've done is over a few years I've collated a lot of information I've done what we call freedom of information every police service in the UK has been contacted and asked how many cases do you have you had in the last 10 years of satanic ritual abuse okay and do you know what Surrey come back with none <laughs> the, the Metropolitan Police come back with none but other counties have said we've had a thousand Hertfordshire yeah. has got in the hundreds a small little county north of London hundred, next door to Surrey hundreds of them Scotland again you know so it depends which ones are honest and which ones aren't yeah. They are deliberately covering up satanic yeah. ritual abuse. John, we have about uh, maybe maybe around 10 minutes. To, I don't know if, exactly how Actually, many. Actually, we've got, uh, uh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. We've got about yeah. uh, 15, 15, 18 minutes. Go ahead. Okay. I wanted to, if John could, uh, John, in all of this, a couple of things, I think one thing, and I just want to throw this out to you to pray about. Um, we want to. We brought Wilford Wong over here to do a conference here and speak here. So, I'm going to be talking with you off, you know, the next few weeks here. Uh, maybe, John, we want you to come over here. We'll fly you over here and, and have you speak over here. And let's give a broader picture to all this. Let's also ask the questions, what can we do to help yeah. the United Kingdom to, you know, come to terms? How what can, what can the body of Christ, you know, real believers, real, you know, believers that know the power of God in prayer, what can be done? You and I both know that we can't crack into all of it without the power of God, nor can they find healing without that, you know, Jesus and the love of God and the, and the healing that Jesus brings. So we need to address that side of it too. With our time that we have right now, though, could you, um, could you give us an update? Wilford Wong has been mentioned everywhere. We have really spoke about him. Uh, Tom Dunn has really put a lot out concerning him. He was on. He's he was flown here to the United States and spoke in a conference uh, on live stream. And we knew that he was speaking out name, just like you're doing. Uh, the concern is in his attempt to try to save a little boy somewhere there in uh, Wales. Um, so you tell us, did it go wrong? Was it a yeah. was it was it a? You know, yeah, you know? I mean, w w Wilfred. Um, the trial starts on Monday in the Crown Court in the north of England, the northwest of England. Uh, this goes back to the Halloween time of last year. Information had come Wilfred's way of, of a young boy, um, I think maybe 10 years old, and there was allegations that his father uh, may have been, again, I'm careful with my words, I don't want to frustrate anything, may have got this boy caught up in ritualistic abuse. Um, it, this looks like, again, I'm very careful with my words here, because it, cause we're, it's illegal for us to talk about an ongoing case in the mm. UK. Um but apparently, this looks like that this is a rescue attempt that's gone wrong, mm -hmm. that, that has gone wrong. Um, for whatever reason, the uh, the child was not removed to what, what should have been a really a place of safety. Mm -hmm. um, whether Wilfred was doing it lawfully or unlawfully, that's down to the courts to say. Um, hopefully, there's a common law angle which, which will cover Wilfred that he was acting you know, um, out of common law to protect life and limb, maybe. We'll wait yeah. and see. Uh, Wilfred, the car was was intercepted by armed police on, on a motorway, the highway, heading towards the south of England. There's an allegation Wilfred had a knife on him. 
Well, again, Wilfred's a former military guy that does a lot of outward bound stuff, outdoor surveillance. Of course, I would have an eye for me as well, you know. So he was portrayed negatively by the national media as being some crazed child abducting, knife wielding um, lunatic. Right. I have written to the prison we was in, the governor, and said, This is not the truth. Told him who I am. This is a man that, that, that does nothing but dedicate his life in exposing child abuse at a very high level and the protection of children. So, right. Wilfred. Uh, there were, I think there was Wilfred and six um, co-defendants. There might have been five co-defendants. I'm not too sure exactly. One of them, unfortunately, died in, in mysterious circumstances in prison, one of the male members. And I think the, the uh, official inquest was it was a suicide attempt. But again, it right. hasn't been confirmed. Wilfred is due to stand trial next week. Wilfred has been remanded in, in uh, a prison in the United Kingdom with the highest levels of violence. Um, but I've spoken to Wilfred. I spoke to him last week. Um, I've, I've been informed by the prison governor. Wilfred is safe. He is well-liked. He is well-respected. He is, he is running um, courses, um, you know, Bible classes and that. He is helping people with paperwork. Um, he is doing advocacy work because we have a, a, a horrendous reoffending rate. I think we've got the worst in the Western world of 80%. Mm. Um, a, a lot of the guards have watched, the, the prison guards, the prison officers have watched his videos. You know, so he's right. incredibly well respected. Pretty there was good. a massive attempt by the British media to denigrate this man. Luckily, by all these campaigners, we have redressed that, put that right. Wilfred and myself have been targets of attack by pro-satanic groups for a long, long time. You know, there's one called Hoaxted, which is always out there to anyone who's speaking out about Satanism gets attacked by this underbelly of pure filth. But again, so what? And like Wilfred used to say to me, if you upset a Satanist, you're doing a good job. Keep <laughs> going. Right. So it looks like, in essence, this is a rescue attempt of a kid that was in a lot of trouble that has gone drastically wrong. And uh, we'll really have convicted could stand um, a long time in prison, but hopefully right. justice yep. will prevail and, you know, and God willing, he will come out. But um, let's pray for Wilfred. He is an yep. incredible individual. Absolutely. Absolutely. Everybody, we're going to be praying for Wilfred Wong in England. Uh, be praying that the Spirit of God guides and leads and, and brings out truth and brings out more. And Wilfred's been really concerned. He's been more concerned about what happened to the little boy than even his own um, imprisonment. Uh, matter of fact, one of his statements I was told was, um, being in prison is a cakewalk compared to what the kids go through in abuse. So that tells you again, we, we know him. We think he's a man of great integrity as a brother in Christ. Uh, we were with him, praying with him. We've met him in Scotland. We brought him here. We are planning on coming back anyway. So John, I could tell you this much during this broadcast here, it's going to go out to a lot of individuals and uh, we want everybody to be praying for John Wedger, the John Wedger Foundation. Uh, we want uh, anybody and everybody in the UK to be, you know, if you're a believer, it's it's it is our responsibility to be involved. To you know, we we should be the cutting edge in all of this anyway. We should be way out in front uh, to confront this, to engage this, to pray against this. There's a spiritual battle behind this. It takes powerful believers to pray and cut through this to rescue kids, but also then. I don't know about how you feel about this, John, but I've never seen a perpetrator just quit doing it on their own. They need to be dealt with. They need to be brought down, exposed and brought down and stopped. Uh, some of these perpetrators have hundreds of uh, victims on their own, let alone the satanic side. So powerful believers praying hard, praying strong, uh, targeting all this, going after this. And we need, we need officers that uh, maybe are within the system that are believers to say, you know what, I, mean, I, need, to, I need to be as faithful and, and, and true and, and no cover-ups. we got to go against cover-ups. We, we see that here in the United States in cases. Um, over there, uh, it seems so much worse, John. And I want everybody to know that we're, gonna, we're, we're supporting you. We're praying for you. We love you. Um, I'll talk to you this week more about uh, us coming there and about maybe getting you to come over here for a few days. Thank and you. Uh, let's just keep working hard. 
God bless you, my brother. Thank you so much. Uh, Doug, I'm going to turn it back to you. All right, uh, John, before you go, I have two questions for you, sir. Um, number yep. one, do you, do you, sir, do you have a, uh, I know you have a Patreon and we're going to link everything on in, within the program descrip- description box for today's show. Do you have a PayPal address uh, for donations or just a Patreon? Uh, I've got a Patreon site. I have got PayPal, but I, I couldn't tell you the address. Okay. There's also um, a site called Indiegogo in which we're asking for um, funds because we're going to be putting together a series of, of documentaries about su- survivors of abuse, uh, but not just satanic abuse, but also just care home abuse. So Indiegogo, if you go on their website, John Wager, you'll find the funding. Again, I have a Patreon site. Um, I want to give a big shout out to a church in London called Pillar of Fire, which is proactive in its deliverance work for victims and survivors of satanic ritual abuse. A good guy called Pastor Patrick needs a tremendous shout out, you know, and uh, again, there's an old saying, in order for the triumph of evil, it takes but for good guys, good men to do to do nothing, right. you know, and let's do something. We uh, must do something. Uh, all right, uh, John, one last question. You, you, uh, you, you gave an acronym, I believe it was RAINS or RAIMS, uh, can, can, Rain, you, yeah. can you slowly g- yeah. give, give that to yeah. me again? I'll, I'll give it to right. Phonetically, Romeo, Alpha, India, November, Sierra. If you Google that, Rain's, list, Rain's Satanic List, you should get this list come up. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, uh, it, it's an incredible, an incredible document. All, all right. We'll, we'll link to that as well. But uh, John Ledger... John Wedger Foundation. Hey. I'm going to get you right one of these days. Uh, I don't know what I'm thinking. All right, uh, Mr. Wedger, I want you to take care of yourself. Be very, very careful. Um, and may God bless you. We're going to be talking again, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, John. Thank you, Russ. And I'll Thank speak you, soon, Russ. God bless you all. Thank Bye-bye. you. Blessings, brother. Blessings, brother. R- Russ, hang with me here. Yep, we, we've, sure. got, we've got a few minutes. We've got a few minutes left. And, and as I opened up with, um, Russ, uh, um, to me, this is perhaps the most important program of the year, um, or that I can remember, given the information that uh, Mr. Wedger had uh, provided, and yep. of course what you uh, and your team is doing. So uh, we've got uh, we've got about uh, eight minutes. So wherever you want to go, yep. sir, go ahead. Sure. Well, I think that I mean to hear this from the UK, like. I mean, some people hear me and see things and we talk about things and, and, and by the way, just to mention again, I've read, you know, I've read Doug's first book when it came out, when I first read it, I said, I I knew that we were connected in the actual crime, you know, what you were, you know, involved with, we believed we were involved with the same group that was behind all that. I want everybody to know too, the, the next book, Doug just read a brand new book and, uh, you know, in the dark of night. And it reminds me of Jesus talking about, um, the weed and the tares, the parable and, you know, the wheat, you know, the, the people are getting born again and they're believers in God. And, and then the, during the night an evil one comes and he begins to create the tares. So it's an ingre- incredibly, uh, titled, well, uh, Doug, and I'm, I'm saying this because of my background, because I, I've, um, I put out probably, you know, 60 books, content after content after content. There's facts to be found. There's information to be found. The victims, ex- the existence of the victims alone uh, in five generations from 75 all the way down to five-year-olds, all those same components of split personality, demonization, sexual, ritual, uh, all the, the, the hoods, the blood, everything John talked about, we've engaged for um, you know four, about four decades now. And what I'm really glad about is that this new book you put out, I mean, it is literally one of the best pictures. So someone reading in the dark of night is reading what we have seen as and and I believe that everything you're writing is about actual crime and, and engaging actual cases. These are the cases. 
these are the things. Uh, this is, in a lot of ways, how some law enforcement looked at it. Like you heard, John, many people, you know, because there's no education on the subject in law enforcement. Basically, people don't know what to look for. The signs they don't they don't understand things. Uh, they they look at a multiple personality person or a demonized person, and all they know is to take them to a psych ward, uh, and not and how to investigate. So. In the book, you you have a, a, a tremendous cutting edge about how to investigate and and begin to go after, and you use the correct language about satanic ritual abuse crimes. This is important to me because as many victims as I, I personally has worked with, I've worked with hundreds of SRAs for four decades, and we have we have so many. Doug, right now, I can't even get to all of them. Our teams can't get to all of them, even though we have more workers and our goals. We're going to go after thousands to become workers to help victims and pray and deliverance and healing. But we also need, like in the dark of night, we need spirit-filled, God-guided, God-directed, miraculous inter, you know, investigation into this underworld. You heard John. Uh, most people have not heard these things about they use remote viewing to observe or astral projection, as we would call it, too, to uh, protect their sites. And so that you, you know, we've got to understand, and I've said this for years, feds, law enforcement, one of the reasons they can't nail it all down is there's a supernatural component to this that the dark side has to cover this up. Um, that's why you have the Franklin case, you have the McMartin case, you have the pizza gate, all these kind of cases. And by the way, since last night in a conversation, I have new content concerning Abramovic and you're going to be, it's going to blow your mind on this, this Doug. And we may be able to now talk about actual broader factual information and, and ongoing satanic rituals that, that, that are connected to that. So we need more investigators. We need people that are going to be spirit filled, guided, prayer oriented. And that's how you're going to dig into this. But I believe if thousands and thousands, Doug, will pray and pray and pray that God will just rip open the underground. Ezekiel chapter 8, God willed that the, the underground satanic stuff going on would be you know, ripped open and, and uh, verified and, and a spotlight by God put on it, and it's written in Scripture. So if you look at Ezekiel 8, you'll see the mode of operation is the same today, but there's just, on a global scale, uh, it is, it is beyond, if I give the numbers, people sometimes just don't, you know, they look the other way, but you're talking 500 million rituals a year because of the numbers of people worldwide. The, the, the numbers of victims are still going up. We're, we're beyond, we're beyond 120 million worldwide from five years old all the way up to 70. And that's going to include Scotland and England and London and all the rest. So to hear this little bit today is is a is a great big window into John Wedger's uh, experience, knowledge, helping boots on the ground uh, uh, encounters with all of this, and we 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 trust, and we're going to believe that God's going to just simply bring tons of individuals to help. And uh, you and I, we're going to do some some uh, like the Book of Daniel, chapter eleven, Doug. We're going to do in the name of Jesus some great exploits. In this, in this vein, put some bad guys away, bring it down, help as many victims as we can. And thank you again, brother. Hey, my friend, uh, uh, the absolute best of the best in my view, Russ Dizdar, ShatterTheDarkness.net. Please, folks, support Russ in his, in his de endeavors. Um, he, he does more in one day than I think most uh, investigators do in a week. So thank you, Russ. God bless you, my friend. We'll be talking. All right. Good night. Good Thanks. night. Folks, uh, you know, we've taken some time off. You, you, you heard basically the subject matter, the things that we've been, we've been addressing. And, uh, what I've seen with Russ and his team and, um, also with Craig Sawyer as well, working, working of course, miles and miles and miles away. Um, this is, this is, this is, well, you heard what John Wedger said. This is the glue that holds this power structure together. This satanic 
criminal activity. It's abhorrent. And we can't even begin to describe the things that go on. You heard a little bit with John. That's not even, that just touches the surface. Folks, I want to thank you for tuning in. Please, please tell everyone, everyone you know about this broadcast. Listen to it more than once. I know it got, got a little bit uh, a little bit rough there, uh, but please spread the word. May God bless each and every one of you. Have a great night.